I have two books at my bedside, Lieutenant. The Marine Corps Code of Conduct and the King James Bible. I hate snakes, Shock! I hate them! And may the Christian Lord guide my hand against your Roman popery! And they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom! We're on a mission from God. I'm entitled. You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! Maybe we should chug on over to Mamby Pamby Land where maybe we can find some self confidence for you, you jackwagon! Coming to you live from his padded cell high atop Bethel Church, the most heralded, the most despised talk show in all of human history. This is the talk show Hell Hates. This is Pastor Mike Online. And here we are coming to you live from our top secret broadcasting compound here at Area 52. This is Pastor Mike and I'm online and I am truly live with you today. Uh... 48 hours and counting before we depart for Nairobi, Kenya, Samburu, Kenya, uh, Turkana, Kenya, Kilimambogo, Kenya. And I'm getting excited. I really am. I appreciate all of the prayers. I appreciate all of the support. I appreciate the encouragement. And um, I I think God is going to do some good, good things um, with uh, Pastor Mike Hutzel, Pastor Jason Hutzel, his son, youngest, uh, second son. He's got three and a daughter. And um, then myself and Sweetie Pie, Michael and Alicia, are on a jet plane <sighs> headed out there now to get things ready. They'll pick us up at Jomo Kenyatta Airport uh, Friday night, somewhere probably around 9 30, 10 o'clock. Kenya time. They are about eight hours ahead of us. So when I do Pastor Mike online a week from today, when I do Pastor Mike online a week from today, it will be about four o'clock in the morning, central time, five Eastern, four Central. Three Mountain, two Pacific. Either get up early or stay up late. Anyway, I have been, and I mentioned this this weekend, I have been uh, watching, you know, some things just capture my attention. And um, number one, our astute members of the official Bethel Church Watchman Broadcast Facebook page. You guys, you're doing a you're doing a great job uh, because somebody picked up on this. I'm going to show you. Uh, we're we're going to do some some videos today. I'm going to show you some video clips of uh, a, an, a happening down in Georgia, and it appears that. The devil really has down gone down to Georgia. It, that's what it, in the in the form of a lying sign and wonder. Um, and I'll tell you about it in a little bit. Um, as you probably know, uh, if you've been watching me, um, I have always had an interest in. The common term is magic. However, um, most of what is termed magic is simply prestidigitation, where you are led to believe that something is really happening when, however, it has not happened. Because sometimes the hand is quicker than the eye, and you can be, people can be led, it's right here. 
I didn't really make it. I don't have magic powers. Okay. I learned this trick just a long time ago. I like to do it with little kids. I like to make things disappear. I mean, watch. This is how simple this is. Okay. Anybody can do this. A coin, a lid. Okay. The effect is you grasp it with the hand, but it's right there. It's called palming. Magicians, prestidigitation, illusion artists, they are masters at using their hands and fingers to hold items that you would not, you would not see. And there's palming methods. There are there are coin methods where you know they can show you the you know the front of a hand. They're hiding a coin in there. I've even seen. I, I'm not kidding you. I, I I don't have one of these. But a guy, a, a fellow pastor friend of mine, did a trick in front of me, and I just went nuts. I'm going, how in the world did you do that? I'm watching your hand. How in the world did you do that? What he did is he made a handkerchief disappear. And I'm just going, what? How, where is it? And when he showed me, he had a fake thumb. And this thing was about twice as big as his real thumb, and it was sick in there. And what you do, you put the fake thumb over your real thumb, and then you say you're, and you hold a handkerchief in that hand. You say you're going to poke it in this hand, so you make a hole with this hand. But really what you're doing is you're pulling the fake thumb off of your real thumb, then you take the handkerchief, you poke it down into that fake thumb, and then when you pull your hand out, the handkerchief's gone. And you've got this humongous thumb on your but nobody notices it. And so to make it reappear, you just the fake thumb is over the real thumb with the handkerchief stuffed inside. So you say, I need to make another hole here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it reappear. So what you're doing is you're pulling the fake thumb off with the handkerchief in it, and you just go, zip, 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 and you pull that out. But it's it's misdirection, it's prestidigitation, it is illusion, it is not real, it's fake. And there are there are professional fakers out there. Now, the kind that I like are the professional, what they call magicians. They use tricks. They use illusions. They use misdirection. They use, you know, false bottoms in a platform. They use fake thumbs. They use palming, all kinds of methods. Card tricks. I know a few card tricks. I, I like to do card tricks for people because people are, they, if, if they don't know the trick and they don't know the methods, you can fool a lot of people. Uh, mental magic. I've talked about that before, where mentalists will use certain methods to force someone to make a decision or to choose something or whatever. And it, it works. If you really know what you're doing, it works. Now, there's, there's some, you know, controversy about you know, whether that kind of stuff should be used like in church ministry or whatever. I know some, I, I know a guy who's a children's minister and he is a fantastic children's minister. He does, he does juggling. He does, you know, different things, a coin, you know, prestidigitation and illusions and so on. Just real simple things for kids. It draws their attention. Some people don't like that. So I just, I just don't do it. But I like a good magic trick. A trick, an illusion. I like a good one, and I like to study it. I like to figure it out. So, some things just capture my attention. And when it, the kind, like I said, the kind of, the kind of um, illusions that I like are the professional or amateur magicians, uh, David Copperfield, Penn and Teller. Um, oh, who are some of these? Other? Anyway, I, I just like it. And I like to study it. I like to figure out how they did it. The kind that I don't like are the people who make other people think that they really have supernatural powers. But the truth is, they don't. They are using fakery, prestidigitation, illusions, 
tricks. Um, they are using mentalist tricks. Practically anybody who learns a few simple techniques on how to read somebody, on how to lead somebody into giving them information without them knowing that they gave them information, anybody can do this. And there are people out there. Um, I, I just drew a... I, I've been watching these guys all weekend. I just drew a blank. There was a guy by the name of James Heydrich back in the 70s. He appeared on That's Incredible! And he was on some other... He was interviewed, various news organizations, so on. He had a... Uh, he was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Young man. And he had a, um, a dojo... A karate, kung fu, martial arts dojo in Salt Lake City. And what he wanted to was he wanted, he had this rich woman, old woman, backing him up. He wanted to build a monastery for, he said, adults and children. It's a clue there where I'm going. And uh, so he could teach them his, now he, he was very gifted at... Uh, some of his acrobatics, some of his martial arts skills. Um, he could he could put his he could put the end of his toe on the rim of a basketball goal. Okay, I saw him do it. Things like that. But he included in that the fact that he was putting himself out as this amazing psychic and he could move things with his mind he could move pencils on a table he could cause leaves on plants to flicker he could turn the pages of a yellow pages book simply by using the powers of his breath and when a guy by the name of Danny Corum caught up with him he made a documentary about him in the early 80s. Uh, another magician by the name of James Randi, um, who, I don't know if he's still alive, but for years, James Randi spent hours and hours and hours debunking psychics, debunking people like that. He's got a challenge out there. His foundation has a challenge, a million-dollar challenge, a check for a million dollars to any psychic who could prove beyond a reasonable doubt uh, with certain, um, certain scientific testing conditions in place that any psychic who could actually prove that they had supernatural psychic powers. He's had this going on for like 30 or 40 years, and to this date, he's never written a single check to anybody. James Randi is the guy who busted Peter Popoff who was a televangelist, still is. Peter Popoff in the 70s and 80s went around the country, went around the world, claiming he was getting, hearing things from God, personal details about people, and, and uh, amazing details like their address and their ailments and their name. And he would call them out like he's hearing from God. He would call them out. He would call them by name. And he said, you live at such and such place. Yeah, uh, you've got cataracts and you've got a bad back and God's going to get rid of your cancer and he's going to heal your thyroid condition. And these people are just dying in tears. They're just going, oh, this is God. And he would hit them on the head. They'd fall backward. And then they would say, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. James Randi sent a guy in as a posing as a security guard one of the venues he was at with a radio scanner. And he found the frequency that his wife was using behind the stage in a microphone speaking into a radio transmitter. Peter Popoff had the earpiece in his ear. His wife was reading prayer cards that people filled out before they went in. Prayer cards with their name, address, and ailments. And she was, and he captured the audio. Went on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and 
prove that Peter Popoff was a scam artist in national television. That year, Peter Popoff had to declare bankruptcy. But now, he's back at it, making more money than he ever did. People, I'm telling you, there are people out there who want to be lied to. They want to be deceived. They, they do not want the truth. They can't. You can't handle the truth. They can't. And, and this is why if you read a Bible, the King James, and you believe it, get out on your face before God and tell God thank you that you believe the word of God over everything because God led you to that. God drew you to that. God elected you to that. God proved it to you. You're one of a minuscule group of people who have decided, I'm not going to be lied to. And if I don't read it word for word in this book, I won't believe it. They, they're fakers. They are phonies. They lie. They deceive people. They take their money. And they say, but I'm giving people hope. I'm giving them dreams. Let me get back to James Heydrich. Danny Corum himself was a professional magician. And he knew that James Heydrich was using trickery to turn the book, turn the pages of a telephone book. James Randi figured it out because Bob Barker, you remember him from The Price is Right? He used to have a, a primetime TV show. I forgot what it was called, but it was a great show. But he had James Heydrich on and James Randi. And Heydrich was going to turn the pages of a telephone book with his mind, live. There were three scientists um, and uh, some kind of uh, in electrical engineer, uh, a physicist and a psychiatrist or something like that. They were there as judges. James Randi had a check for James Heydrich, was going to write it to him if he said, if you can prove beyond any doubt that you can turn these pages with your mind alone. And he said, here's the conditions of the test. They laid the telephone book down on the table. They opened it up. James Heydrich there, he's got one of these Ace of Spades costumes to make him look cool. And when they opened the telephone book, James Randi to open up a bag and he poured out a big pile of little foam peanuts. Very lightweight foam peanuts. Because the trick is, let me show it to you. I probably won't be able to do it with this. The pages are too heavy. But the trick is, Hydric would just go, you know, like this. And like he's having a, you know, a bowel movement. And he would then approach the telephone book. And all of a sudden, the page would flip over. And he wouldn't touch it. And the trick was, Hydric had practiced this. He knew that if he blew a short blast of air on the table surface, I'm doing a lousy job, ain't I? That he could turn the pages of a telephone book or a Bible. Heydrich learned that trick in prison. Fact of it is, Heydrich's still alive. Heydrich has spent more of his life inside prison than he has as a regular citizen. It all goes back to a severely abusive childhood. And I mean severely. I feel sorry for the guy in that manner. He had no, no choice over how he grew up. But he's, he learned all these tricks in prison. Third grade education. But he learned that if he could blow on across the surface of the table. And he even perfected it to where he could blow a short blast of air and turn his head quickly so that you think his head is turned while the page is moving. So when James Randi poured out the foam particles on the table, Heydrich knew that he couldn't blow on it. 
it would move the little foam peanuts. So after about two or three minutes, he claimed that the static, the electricity from the, um, from the foam peanuts with the lighting was creating electricity and it causes the pages to not move. And, and they asked one of the, the experts and they said, these foam peanuts do not produce electricity. They don't produce it. So the conditions of the, te he, lost, he, he lost on live television. Then Corum showed him to be, he, Danny Corum actually got James Heydrich to confess on camera that he used fakery, but he said, I'm doing it for good, not for evil. It's still wrong. And there are people all over the world. Psychic powers are believed by billions of people all over the world. And these people, whether you really think there is a spirit involved or not, if they're faking it, it's still of the devil. If they're lying, there's, it's still of Satan. It's not of God. It never was of God. Deuteronomy 18. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little bit. And then I'm going to show you a psychic, Sylvia Brown. And a particular law enforcement case that I personally have um, a little bit of background with. All right. Nationally known uh, case, abduction case. And I don't know the people. I don't know the family, but I know people. I know families who know the family. It was from Richwoods, Missouri. I pastored in Richwoods, Missouri for three years, and I know a lot of people down there. I didn't happen to know Sean Hornbeck's family, but I know a ton of people who know them. And I, when I first heard that Sean Hornbeck had disappeared, eleven years old, he just vanished off the face of the earth. I started questioning what what could go on. There's a lot of methamphetamine cooking down at that's Washington County, Missouri, and it is all woods and there's methamphetamine everywhere down there. I thought that maybe he was riding he was riding his bike and I thought maybe he had stumbled upon somebody's meth lab and they were not going to let him go and they killed him. Rich Woods uh, is a settlement that goes all the way back to the 1700s. Because they mined what's called tiff. The name for it now is barium. If you've ever had a barium swallow, ugh, it's tiff. And all around Richwoods are these tiff digs. It, it's, it's like surface level mining. They dig maybe 10, 12 feet down in the ground and pull up all this tiff. And they left these little ponds and little mini lakes everywhere because these tiff digs filled up with water. And there's thousands of them around there. And I just kind of figured somebody killed him and threw him in one of these tiff digs. They were searching. in the, They had cadaver dogs. They were searching everywhere. So that was, that was my impression. I also, my brother-in-law who built this room, Stephen Leonard, back in the day when he was a criminal himself, knew some people that he suspected might have had something to do with it. He was obviously wrong, but that's the kind of people that my brother-in-law used to run with before God saved him, and he built this room, and he's in heaven right now. So let me read, let me read Deuteronomy 18, and when God says this, he's not kidding. When, and you, and here's my favorite thing. Well, that's in the Old Testament. That's not for us. Uh, excuse me, if it's witchcraft, it's still wrong. Doesn't matter what page of the Bible it was printed in first. Deuteronomy 18. Verse 9, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the... By the way, let me get back to James Heydrich. My brain's running 900 miles an hour. James Heydrich had an ulterior motive for everything that he did. Number one, because of his abusive childhood, 
and being severely abused and severely neglected. Heydrich wanted people's attention, naturally. And when he learned his tricks, when he got good at martial arts in prison, he used he used what he had to get. He was he was on that's incredible nationally nationally syndicated TV show in the eighties. I used to love that show. But anyway, he had that motive. He wanted money, he wanted fame, and he wanted to build a monastery. Now I'm not going to tell everything I know, but part of his abusive childhood was James Heydrich would escape in his mind. And here is where I think the real spiritual aspect of this comes into play. James Heydrich, when he was being abused, would shut his eyes and he would, he would leave and go to China, to a mountainous region in China, where he met a Taekwondo, Karate, Judo, whatever master named Master Wu. He knew what the guy looked like. He heard his voice. And Heydrich says that ma this Master Wu took him into his monastery in his mind and taught him secrets, taught him magic, taught him psychic powers, taught him super, taught him taught him karate and taekwondo and all these martial arts as a boy. Now, that's a setup. There were spirits all around young James Heydrich. And I have zero doubt that Heydrich was actually in touch with a familiar spirit. Someone who acted as protector of young James while he was being abused as a boy. Heydrich said that he would go to the moon and back in his mind and not be aware of the abuse going on with his body. He would just travel to the moon and back. There's no doubt that a spiritual force was at work in this poor young boy's life. Now, he wanted to build a monastery in Salt Lake City so he could train children into the ways of martial arts, psychic powers, things like that. Now, Heydrich is in prison now for child molestation. He's a pedophile sodomite, obviously, from his childhood. And what he wanted to do was have a monastery where he was the ruler over these young boys that would come. People would pay him thousands of dollars and send their children here because he could show them that he had magic powers and they would send their boys there and they would trust him. And that would have been disastrous. Okay? God knows what he's talking about. When God tells you not to get involved with practices that involves spirits. He's protecting you. God is protecting you from these spirits and what they are capable of doing to practically anybody. So God said, When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination. Now, I'm going to say this. Knowing what I know about James Heydrich's past, James Heydrich's father, an abusive, drunk, wicked, evil man, made his son to pass through the fire. His father is responsible for Heydrich's getting in touch with these evil spirits by his abuse and neglect of his son. It was, and, and here's, the, here's the thing. When, when the Israelites or the Canaanites or whoever it was were, were passing their children through the fire under Molech, 
The purpose was to appease the gods for the adults' benefit. We want good crops. We want to be rich. We want to prosper. So here's our baby. Burn it and we'll kill it. We'll kill it to, for Molech so Molech will give us what we want. That's what abortion mills are. That's what abusive parents are. They abuse or neglect children for their own selfishness. Disgust me. Absolutely disgust me. Now, make his son or his daughter pass through the fire that useth divination. Whether it's fake or real, God said don't do it. Um, or an observer of times, astrologers. Those who say that God is more powerful on certain days than other days, okay? That's an observer of times. Jim Staley said it before he went to prison. Jim Staley actually said, I believe when we observe times on Yahweh's calendar, he said those words, observe times on Yahweh's calendar, okay? He was an observer of times or an enchanter. Someone using incantations, vain repetitions, Jesus called it, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits. Psychics, mediums, tarot card readers, palm readers, uh, aura readers, people who can see your, oh, I love your aura, dude. Your aura is pretty cool, man. These people are consulting with a familiar spirit, which is a devil. Uh, or a wizard or a necromancer. A necro Listen to this. A necromancer is someone in touch or using the powers of dead people. Necro means dead. It's a Greek word. Mancy is like cardomancy. Cardomancy is magic or divination by cards. Okay? Geomancy is divination by means of earth magnetic powers. People, don't fall for this stuff. Don't fall for it. There is no special magic in the earth other than devils, other than Gaia. There's no special magic. You, we don't have to be in a certain place in order to find God. We don't have to be facing north, south, east, and west. We don't have to stand at this spot on the carpet in the church in order to get the anointing. It's a lie. It's a setup. These, these big evangelists saying, God is pouring out supernatural anointing on the city of Nashville right now. You need to come to get your supernatural anointing that's in Nashville, Tennessee right now. The power is here in Nashville. They want you to come and bring your wallet to Nashville. It's a setup. You want God, you want God to bless you? Open your Bible and read it and believe it. God will bless you. I, I hate... I hate every false way, and I hate fakers. I, ha I hate their ways. I despise people who deliberately and knowingly lie, and especially when they say it's about God. Now, that's one thing. If they're going to say, I, I believe in angels and spirits and, and, and the, the spirits of departed people are helping us. I mean, that's one thing. That's obviously kooky. But to use it in the name of God, I loathe people like that. Because they, all they want is attention, power, and money. A young lady who put herself out as a psychic. I said this the other day. Um, she conned this young man. Number one, I mean, this guy was posting selfies of him and his pretty young lady psychic. So obviously this girl was leading him on big time. And he was going to her and she was doing readings for him and she was charging him tons of money. He was pulling he was stealing out of his own mother's retirement account up to $400,000 he had given to this psychic lady. Then she tells him he's got a curse on him and she could lift it, but it's going to cost five hundred grand. So he pulls the rest of his own mother's retirement money out of the... But by then, the police got involved and he was going to cooperate with the police. Mom got involved. So they set up a sting where 
the psychic and her boyfriend was going to meet this guy at a bank to transfer the money. And she obviously didn't see into the future because had she done that, she would have seen that the police were waiting there with a set of handcuffs. She didn't see that coming. Okay? Just miss that one. Maybe she, just, maybe she didn't pay herself enough money or whatever, but she did not see that coming. They got her on grand larceny, and she had to give every dime of it back. I hate these things. God hates them. You ought to hate them as well. I don't like fakers, especially the ones in the name of God. Whether this woman really is getting help from familiar spirits or she's just cold reading people and using leading questions to get information out of them so she could use it and say, I know this, I already knew that. It's evil one way or the other. It is evil. Now, Sean Hornbeck, 11-year-old boy, out riding his bicycle, vanished off the face of the earth. Let me read uh, some of the information about Hornbeck. Again, I don't know this family. I never met him, but I know a ton of people who knew him. I know the community. I know the people, and I know the places where he could have disappeared. I mean, he could have been anywhere out there in the middle of those woods, okay? And they would have never found him. Uh, let's see, when did this happen? Uh, let's see here. October 6, 2002, just vanished. Boom, gone. And, I mean, they were searching everywhere for this kid. Found Nothing. They had no leads. They, ha I mean, people were calling in saying, hey, I know this and I know that and I know these people here and I think, I think they could have done it. And they were chasing down every lead imaginable. They were going to every house and trailer in Washington County, in Franklin County, Jefferson County, St. Francis County. These are the neighboring counties looking for this boy coming up empty-handed every single time. So, Sean's mother and stepfather are invited to the Montel Williams show. Montel would have psychic Sylvia Brown on his show to do psychic readings or to, and now you need to understand, if you've never heard of Sylvia Brown, she was famous all over the world. And Sylvia Brown actually was being called by local law enforcement agencies saying, we're coming up dry on everything. We're going to try this. Will you come and help us out with this case? Because we have no idea how to proceed. So they would try a psychic. This is done all over the world. Even in supposedly Christian nations, psychics are called in to help law. And these psychics love that. They love it. When they get called by law enforcement, that legitimizes, in their eyes, that legitimizes their certain skill sets. And they love to put that on their resume. I've, I've, I've helped countless local law enforcement agencies solve crimes, crack crimes. I've helped them. I've saved people's lives. I've helped them find bodies. I've helped them do this. Out of a hundred guesses, anybody could be right on a few of them. Anybody could. So they, here, now here is this grieving mother, lost a son, has no idea where he is. He Everybody had him dead. I had him dead. No, no, I didn't kill him. He's still alive, by the way. I had him dead, and so did everybody else. And this went on five years. Five years he was missing. So, Sean Horbeck's mother and father go on the Montel Williams show with Sylvia Brown, who's paid for this. 
This lady gets booked years in advance. If you want a reading from her, you've got to set an appointment for like three or four. She's dead now, but that's that was her clientele, and she could charge whatever she wanted. 700, 800, 1,000 bucks for 20 minutes. Okay? Plus being paid by law enforcement, being played by, paid by newspapers, the books that she wrote. I mean, this lady's raking it in. And she's lying through her teeth. She's lying through her cigarette-stained teeth. And you'll hear it when you hear her voice. I'm going to, I'm going to play the clip from the Montel Williams show. I know YouTube is going to have a, a, a chest convulsion because I'm playing something that's copyrighted, but it is for educational purposes only. I make no claim to the copyright of this particular video, YouTube. And then I'm going to interject in what really happened to Sean Hornbeck. See, I remember this program when it came on. Because it made local news that Sean Hornbeck's mom and dad went to the Montel Williams show. Sylvia Brown did this reading. And here, here's, here's the episode now of the Montel Williams show. Uh, let me click a couple things here. All right, here we go. Please welcome Sean's parents, Pam and Craig, to the show. You have done everything, almost everything conceivably possible to at least try to find a clue, something from organizing search parties and the community has gotten involved and still yet not even a whim, is there? Is there any whim at all of what happened? There's absolutely no evidence to support any, any kind of theory. He left the house, I'm sorry, he left the house at what time? 1.15. And there were some children who said that they saw him at what time? Around 4. There's been sightings up to 4.30. But he was only traveling to a friend's house, which was seven-tenths of a mile away, so he could have gotten there in five or six minutes. So we think, and none of his other friends anywhere in, around saw him, correct, between that time? No, most the friends that he played with normally on a regular basis didn't see him that day. Um, there were just some other kids that he normally didn't play with that have seen him. Uh, who, does, who did he know? Or who do you know of by the name of Keith? Keith? Is it a kid or an uh, adult? No, no. It's a young kid. Because there's somebody by the name of Keith, a blonde kid, who saw him after this 4.30 period. Doesn't, doesn't ring any bells. Well, have well to I'd ask, ask. Okay, right stop right here. All right. Sylvia Brown. Cold reading. Or... She obviously knew certain things about the, the police case. And she knew some things about the incident. So, where did she get the name Keith? <coughs> Nowhere. She made it up. She, and she was obviously wrong. She says, I'm getting a Keith. I'm getting, I'm getting the name Keith. Keith is coming to, it's real strong. Who, who is it that he, that he knows a blonde headed kid named Keith? And they're going, uh, there, a Keith? He, he doesn't have, there's no Keith. Now, granted, you need to understand, in this community, everybody knows everybody out there. I spent three years out there. I'm telling you. If there was a Keith out there, they would have said, yeah, there's a Keith that lives, you know, six miles away. You know, he go, he ride his bike down his house all the time. Not one Keith anywhere. No blonde-headed boy named Keith. Now, come to find out that along with being, along with Sean Hornbeck being abducted, the same guy that abducted Sean Hornbeck abducted another little boy five years later. But his name wasn't Keith. It was, um, what was it? Brian 
uh, let's see. On, on, let's see. What was his name here? Uh, on, on B. I'm trying to find. I'm on uh, Wikipedia. And uh, let's see. There's okay. They yeah. They found Brian. I think it was Brian Ownby. And um, but no, no, nothing, nothing related to Keith whatsoever. What she's doing, she's grasping. Because if I were to say the name to you. Now I'm getting I'm getting a Keith. Do you know a Keith? Who doesn't know a Keith? I mean everybody in the country, everybody in America knows somebody named Keith. Okay? So that's a that's what that is. It's a it's a way that a mentalist or a or a psychic can get you on their side by saying a name, a generalized name that 95% of people are going to know some guy named Keith or John or Bill or Mike or whatever. So she throws out this bait called Keith. But Sean Horbeck's mom and stepdad have no clue who that is. And the case file is out there. There is nobody named Keith associated with this kid. Not one. That's their tactics. She thought she would try it. And it turned up bupkis. So, let's continue on, my friends. Live that far from where the friend is. You see what I mean? He wasn't a best friend, but he sort of goes in and out of the group. Okay. What she did right there is... Since the name Keith, see, she was said, I'm getting this real strong. Keith, Keith, a blonde-headed boy named Keith. Now, since there's nothing connecting here, okay, nothing coming up, so she says, well, you know, maybe he's somebody that's in and out. You know, and, and that's what they'll do. They'll change their tactics now about Keith. Now, okay, Keith's not really strongly affected here, but he's it's just somebody in and out. That's why I'm getting the name Keith. So maybe it's somebody you don't know about. The truth of it is, it was nobody. She thought she'd try it. Now, we're going to see something in a minute that's going to make you mad. So get ready for this. Picked up in a, in a blue-colored sedan by um, a guy by the name of um, Michael. And the last name sounds like is somebody who lives in the area, somebody passing through somebody the area? Somebody passing through the area. So like, was it that area. I'm sorry? What was that question? Was it anybody that Sean knew? No. Was he abducted when you say picked up? Yeah, ab abducted, yeah. yeah. He was grabbed. Grabbed. Is yeah. there any Okay, now. Here's what I'm going to tell you. She says now, after Keith turns up, nothing. She then goes into what she is going to tell them happened. She says he was abducted. Okay, we'll give her one. We'll give her one point. Because Sean Hornbeck, was, he was picked up. She says that it was somebody he didn't know. Okay, that's two. Because... Hornbeck did not know the name or the identity of his abductor. Three. She says his name was Michael. She got that right. The name of the man who abducted John Hornbeck was Michael Devlin. Like devil Devlin. Okay? Now... Some say, oh, look, she got that right. I mean, they should have been looking for a guy named Michael. They would have come to my house then. Okay. But here's now here's the thing. How many Michaels are there in the state of Missouri? 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. How the law enforcement going to use this piece of information? They can't. So, 
We have to have an automobile. We have to have a car, a truck, a van, a motorcycle, uh, an Amish horse and buggy, a helicopter, a UFO, anything to pick this kid up in. We have to have a vehicle. So, Brown says, Blue Chevy. It was a white, let's see here. It was a white, I think it was a, uh, yeah, it just says white pickup truck. It was a white pickup truck. Now, the three things that she got right. He was abducted. He didn't know him. And his first name was Michael. Could be guesses or a spirit. I have no doubt. I have no doubt that Sylvia Brown hears from familiar spirits. But here's the thing. I'm reading Deuteronomy 18. And God, God is so good to us, people. He's good to the, to the righteous and to the evil. These instructions here in God's word, anybody can read them. Anybody could look at this. And especially, you know, Richwoods is a religious community. There's churches everywhere down there. Okay? Some of them a little wacky, I get it, but needless to say, it's not a Buddhist or a Muslim community. It's not an atheist community. It is, by and large, a church-based community. Anybody, practically every house down there has a Bible in it. Anybody could have read the Bible here in Deuteronomy 18, because in Deuteronomy 18, not only does God say, don't listen to this quack, she's got an evil spirit in her, but God said, I'm going, to tell, I'm going to teach you how you can know whether or not you're being lied to by a psychic. I'm going to teach you how you can know you're being lied to by a prophet. And so here it is. Verse 22, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him or her. So God said, the accuracy rate of a real prophet has to be 100%. If they're wrong one time, you don't listen to them. Don't trust them. They're lying through their teeth to you. The law of averages says that if there's 20 major clues to this crime, anybody can get at least three of them. And she did. But she didn't stop there with the blue Chevy and the Michael that picked him up. Let's listen. The vehicle other than just a blue the sedan. The vehicle is a blue sedan and I think it's a Chevrolet. Sedan? Uh, it's an older Chevrolet. It reminds me of what I had years ago, you know, with sort of with the tail fins on them, which was what, around 58, 59? It's an old model car. Old model car. I think they called them, what were they, Impalas? Were the Impalas? Yeah. Sure. My dad, my dad bought, when my sis and I were teenagers, he bought a 1960 turquoise blue Chevy Impala with the prettiest tail fin. This thing was absolutely gorgeous. It had an aftermarket air conditioner put in it. I think my dad paid 700 bucks for this car. And when me and my sis come driving into Festus High School every morning for concert choir with that car, everybody made fun of us because they called it, they said we're driving the Batmobile. Okay? It was, I mean, it was awesome. You know, we come in riding that Batmobile, you know, that 1960 turquoise blue Chevy Impala. Now, Sylvia Brown, has. she just said, I, I used to have one of these cars. I remember back in the day. So where did she get it from? She got it from her own memory. It was, and you would know, you would know the difference between a 1960 turquoise blue Chevy Impala with these tail fins on them, the difference between that and a white pickup truck. I'm pretty sure there's a difference between them. 
she got it wrong. But she's not done lying. Impala. Is there any kind of a description of the person driving the car? Yeah, Listen. The, the guy was um, dark-skinned, um, although he wasn't black. He was more uh, Hispanic-looking. Um, had uh, real long, dark hair. And, strange enough, Hispanic, but he had dreadlocks. Um, he was... Um, really tall and really almost like what you think a basketball player spilled would be. Okay, stop, 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 stop. I'm going to show you a picture of Michael the Devil, Devlin. Okay? The uncanny resemblance of Sylvia Brown's version of Michael Devlin with the real identity be sitting down for this one are you ready hold on she got that wrong that's michael the devil devlin not slender and tall like a basketball player the guy was fat and worked at emo's pizza and had diabetes, in poor health, he had two toes cut off because he was diabetic from eating all the pizza he made at Emo's Pizza. They lied. She lied through her teeth. Brown. He's brown. He's, he's dark-skinned, not black. He's brown like Hispanic, and he has real long dreadlocks, and he's real tall and slender like a basketball player. <laughs> lied through her teeth. So, the police, the police now, looking for an old Chevy Impala with tail fins and a dark brown Hispanic male with dreadlocks. They were. They were looking everywhere for this guy. Nowhere. It wasn't true. She, lo she, she should be locked up. She should be dug up and locked up. Now... Here's the sad part of this one. Because now Sylvia Brown is going to reveal the fate of poor Sean Hornbeck. Can you tell how far from the area he was taken? Maybe about 20 miles. She got that wrong. She got that wrong. He was found. Where was he found? Where, where was he found? He was found, let's see here if I can find the, where, where did Michael Devlin live? He lived in, where did he live? Where did he live? He lived, I think, in Florissant, Missouri, or Ferguson, one of the two. St. Louis, Missouri is his address. And, and I'm going to play this in a little bit. She actually got specific. She said, 20 miles, I believe it was southwest. 20 miles southwest of Richwood. Now, I know a little bit about the air. 20 miles southwest of Richwood is in the middle of the woods. Woods everywhere. Okay? It is, it is rural country. St. Louis, Missouri, where Michael Devlin actually lived, is, I'm going to say, a good, let's see, let's see, I'm going to say a good 70 miles or 80 miles away from Richwoods, not 20 miles, and it's north and east, not south and west, okay? She, liar, can't, I can't stand this, this is making me mad. Get ready. Here it comes. He's still within a 20-mile radius even He's now? He's still within a 20-mile radius of, let's say, here's where you are, 20-mile radius. But it's really southwest of where you are. Southwest. Really so southwest. So whatever is southwest, because it looks like this is, here we go again with the wooded, with the, you know, the wooded area. So southwest of you. Is there any landmarks around? It's yeah. a lie. It's a lie. He was in the city. He was in an apartment complex in the city. Not the woods. Which. 
enough, there are two jagged boulders, which nope. look really misplaced because nope. everything is trees, and then all of a sudden you've got these stupid boulders sitting there. Liar. And he could be found near He's there. near the boulders. Liar. Is he still with us? Do you see the bicycle anywhere? Look at I think look the, at his mom. See, here's what's strange. I think the 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 bicycle is in another state in a dump. Let me take a little break. We'll be back right after this. I hate witches. I hate lying witches. Here's this mother has no idea where her son is. Her stomach tied in knots every day she gets up. She can't sleep at night. She goes on live, well, not live television. She goes on national television. And she has to deal with having 150 million eyes glued on her while she hears from God that her son is dead. And you saw a reaction. By the way, she got the bicycle thing wrong too. So here's what really happened. Michael Devlin was a pedophile. Went looking for an 11 year old boy. So he figured he would go into Washington County, go into rural areas, Franklin County, Washington County, St. Francis County, rural Jefferson County, looking for boys, right? Just looking for boys out walking. Because he knew that out in the middle of nowhere, he could pick up one and be gone. No one would ever see it. So that's what he did. And he's, I don't know how many times he went out looking. But he finally got lucky when he saw Sean Hornbeck, 11 years old, riding his bike miles from his house. So he picked him up, took him back to his apartment, St. Louis, Missouri, and molested him repeatedly over and over and over again. At some point, I don't, uh, I don't recall how long he had kept young Sean, but at some point he told Sean to get in the truck and they were going for a ride. And they went out somewhere in another rural area and Michael Devlin reached over to strangle Sean to kill him. He was going to kill him and bury him because he figured at some point I'm going to get caught and this boy's really not doing it for me anymore. And Sean Hornbeck pleaded for his life. And he swore to Michael Devlin that he would never leave that apartment or give any indication to anyone that he was Sean Hornbeck. And it must have been the grace of God that made Michael Devlin stop and agreed to that and took him back to his apartment, St. Louis, Missouri, 70 miles north and east of Richwood. It's not 20 miles south and west by two jagged rocks out in the middle of the woods. Stupid witch. Here's how he got caught. Sean, let's see, he's 11. Five years later, he's about 16. Now, this whole time, He's not gone to school. Devlin won't let him out of, out of the apartment. At times, he did visit with some of the neighbors there in the apartment building. They never suspected. I don't know why they never saw it, but they never suspected it. So Devlin decides that Hornbeck don't do it for him anymore. So he goes out, rural Missouri, Franklin County this time, which is neighboring to Washington County and finds another little boy named Ownsby. Brian, I think it's Brian Ownsby. Brian Ownsby, something like that. I'm trying to look for the names here on the uh, um, Wikipedia. Uh, yeah, it's Ownsby. 
So anyway, he picks up Ownby, riding his bike, rural area. But a guy saw him, saw the, a general description of Devlin, saw the white pickup truck, and followed it for a little while till he lost it. But he immediately calls the police because now Ownby's missing and they're looking. Everybody now is looking. Now, nobody's connecting this with Sean Hornbeck. So they're looking for Ownby. Devlin takes him back to his apartment. There's Sean Hornbeck. Now he's got this new love interest, a little boy. And for several days, Ownby is missing. Police get a tip. And they go to this apartment complex and they see a white pickup truck. And they start thinking, could this be it? They followed up on the lead, enter the apartment. There's Brian Ownby. And then another boy, 16 years old, who says to the police, I'm Sean Hornbeck. I'm the one that's been missing for years. I, I'll never forget the day because I mean, you, you can imagine it made huge news around here. Sean Hornbeck finally returned home. His mother, the one of the prosecutors, I think, in Washington County, made a call to Hornbeck's mother and said, where are you? And she said, well, we're driving. And he said, pull over. She said, okay. So they pulled over. She said, what's up? What's going on? And the guy said, we have Sean. He's alive. Can you imagine like prodigal son's dad seeing the prodigal son coming over the hillside? Can you imagine the ecstasy that enters these people's minds? Sylvia Brown destroyed these people. For five years, this woman grieved, believing that Sylvia Brown told her the truth. They should have sued her and owned her, took her for everything she had. Let me read you a little bit about Miss S Sylvia Brown. Um, she made the prediction that she would live to be 88 years old. She died at 77. Didn't see that coming. Not only did she get it wrong with Sean Hornbeck, she told the mother of uh, kidnapping victim Amanda Berry, who had disappeared 19 months earlier, she said on national television again, Montel Williams, she's not alive, honey. She's not alive. And she said, she's, I see water. She's in water of some kind. She's buried in water. The truth of it is, they found Amanda Berry alive 10 years after she had been abducted. But it was about a year after her mother died. Uh, what else did she get wrong? In 2002, Brown claimed Holly Crewson, who had disappeared in 1995, was working as an exotic dancer in Hollywood. They found her body in 1996. She lied. 2002, Brown claimed Linda McClelland, who had disappeared in 2000, had been taken by a man with the initials MJ and was alive in Orlando, Florida, and would be found soon. In 2003, McClelland's son-in-law, David Rapaski, who had been present at Brown's reading, was convicted of murdering McClelland. The guy, the guy was in the audience that abducted and killed this girl. And Brown, didn't see, Brown was looking right at the guy and didn't see it. In 2004, Brown said that Ryan Ketcher, a 19-year-old who had disappeared in 2000, had been murdered and his body could be found in a metal shaft. In 2006, Ketcher's body was found in his truck at the bottom of a pond where he drowned. Lied. And she died a multi-millionaire. Multi-millionaire. Now, I've watched Sylvia Brown do cold readings. Walk through an audience and do cold readings. And I watched her as she repeatedly on live television gets it wrong 
time after time after time. James Randi did a show with, I think, um, oh, I can't remember, um, uh, one of these men psychics. Uh, I can't remember his name. But anyway, um, James Randi set up, uh, there was a guy in the audience that met with the psychic, and the psychic did a reading on the guy, and the guy was convinced that this psychic was dead on about what he had found out, about how he had heard from this guy's dead relative. James Randi took the transcript of the reading that this psychic did for this guy, and he read out loud he said to the guy, now you're saying that this psychic found out the name of like your uncle or something like that, that it was David or something like that. And the guy said, yeah, it's like he blew me away. He just nailed it right out of thin air. He named my uncle David. James Randi said, actually, what he did was, and he started reading names, Alton, Alan, uh, Barry, Bobby, Billy, David, Douglas, and he said 37 different names this guy read past you to get the right one. 37 names. Now, the psychic will do it in such a way as the, the, uh, the mark, they call it, will never pick up on it. But when you go back and listen to it, you can see the psychic is reaching and digging for information. They're digging, they're leading questions to get the person to unleash information privately that they can either jump on and guess and get it right, or they just they just tell them outright and the psychic says, yes, that's it right there. I hate, I hate them. I hate what they do to people. Now, again. Psychics doing this, uh, Deuteronomy 13, Deuteronomy 13, psychics who do this in the name of other gods, which are familiar spirits, that's one thing. Deuteronomy 13, if a, there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass. Oh, look at what he did. He can make a bottle cap disappear. Oh, he's got powers. Yeah. And I got some real powers there, don't I? They will convince people that they have powers. Now, again, whether they're faking it, Or a spirit helps them. Either way, a spirit, a lying spirit, a deceiving spirit is involved in it. Like with Ahab, the day before he died, his psychics got it wrong. He had all his psychics say, Oh, Ahab, see these iron horns? You're going to use these iron horns. And you're going you're gonna to push back the enemies. There was a spirit in the mouth of those prophets telling lies. And Ahab literally paid his life for it. Do you remember the Chaldeans, the magicians, the astrologers and sorcerers that worked for Nebuchadnezzar? Do you think they were doing that stuff for free? Do you think that those astrologers were working for the king for nada, nothing, no dinero, no money? No. They were well paid. And Nebuchadnezzar caught them. He said, if you guys really are smart, tell me the dream. Because if you don't, then I'm going to know you've been lying to me all this time. And I said, Nebuchadnezzar, you're kind of being unreasonable with us. I mean, I mean, we, we can't tell your dream. No, nobody's ever done that one. So Deuteronomy 13, he said, And the sign of the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods. That's your psychic. That's your psychic and your 
tarot card reader and your crystal ball gazer, your scryer, your palm reader, your whatever, looking at entrails from a calf or whatever. That's what they do. They are telling you that the spirits of dead people are all around us and they're all and every one of them goes to heaven. No psychic ever gets money from somebody to tell them, uh, I'm sorry, but your Uncle Charlie is burning in hell fire. They don't do that because if people won't come back, they don't want to hear it. You mean he's in heaven? Yes, I see it. He's telling me that he's in heaven and he's fine. And by the way, he also said that there is a secret bank account with a bunch of money in it and to give it to the psychic. <gasps> he really said that? Yeah, that's what I heard just now. Give it to the psychic. I mean, I can't, I can't explain that, but give it to the psychic. And again, it's one thing to have a psychic lie to people. It's another thing entirely when the people are so stupid and gullible that they believe it. Because if the people wouldn't believe it, the psychics would be out of business. And they would go back to being construction workers or architects or whatever. But people believe it. And this is why God sets them up. They do not want to know the truth. They want to, they want to believe in lies. They want a psychic to tell them, that their reprobate, drunkard, fornicating uncle is in heaven. So that gives them hope that they'll probably go to heaven too because I'm better than my drunkard, fornicating uncle. So they believe it because they want to believe it. They want to believe that I have the power to make a bottle cap disappear. Thin air. Now, that's one thing. Go after other gods. But then, to do it in the name of God, then I come unglued. Kudos to whoever found this online a member of the official Bethel Church Facebook group spotted this, said, get pastor's attention with this. So my buddy Steve sent me a text, said, pastor, you got to watch this. So I did. A miracle in Dalton, Georgia, bona fide scientifically researched miracle in Dalton wait 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 in a bookstore a, a Christian book store the word store what does that mean to you right Ching! bookstore not getting a lot of business lately People aren't coming in the doors. People aren't dropping money in the cash register. We gotta have we gotta have people, we gotta have traffic. We gotta have people coming in. We're gonna go out of business. We're gonna have to declare bankruptcy. We got all this stock here. We don't know what to, nobody's buying it. We need to get people in the store. Once they're if they come in, they'll leave their money. It's just the, it's just the law of averages. If people come in, they're gonna, you know you know how I shop. If I go into a store and I don't find anything in there that I want, I'll buy something out of guilt. Especially if I had to use their restroom, I'll buy something because I feel guilty for not for going in there and taking up their air conditioning and using their bathroom and taking up their time and. I didn't buy anything. I'll buy something because I'm guilty. I feel bad. So I'll leave money there. I'm not the only one. 
So the bookstore, nobody's coming in. Nobody's leaving money. And they need the money. So a scientifically researched miracle takes place Dalton, Georgia. Video clip in five, four, three, two, one. Or is it not? Stay with me. Okay, so this Bible leaks oil. What do you what do you do with the oil? When the oil comes out, what what is it used for? It's used it it it, uh, it fills up. Jerry takes it out, puts it into gallon jugs during the week. On Monday night, we come in, people come in, and we put it in small vials. Uh, and we take those vials to the churches with us. We give them away to the people that are there. Okay, that's great. But what does the oil do? What do people do? They get the, the vial of oil. What do they do with it? Let me, let me set this up for you. Guy gets up one day sees a stain on his Bible in his house, immediately thinks that his granddaughter spilled soda pop on it. So he picks it up. Honey, would you spill on Papa's Bible? Nothing, Papa. <laughs> and finds that the Bible is spewing oil or leaking oil. It's oozing oil from it. Oil is gushing out of this Bible. Oh my goodness, it's a, it's a miracle! So, they put the Bible down in a, in a bucket that he got from the farm store and they collect the oil and sometimes it's a miracle on two occasions it's overflowed the bucket oil spilled out all over the carpet ruined the carpet did you see all the people in the bookstore did you see all those people I guarantee you they don't just walk in and walk out empty-handed. Or, let me say it this way, they don't walk out full-walleted. They leave money there. They buy something. There's, there's money going into this bookstore. I guarantee you it. And it looks like a hippie. It looks like something from the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco in the 60s. It looks like a hippie love hangout what it looks like. When they fake God. They don't, listen. If the people who are doing this want to sue me for, what is it, slander or libel? It's slander. Libel's in print. Slander is voice. They want to sue me for slander. Listen. You don't have to be afraid of what I am going to say about you. Whoever owns this bookstore. You don't have to worry about what I'm going to say about you. What I would worry about is what God has said about you. Here we go. What good does it do? What's the purpose? Well, it's just like the scripture in James, the fifth chapter, where he said, those that are sick, call for the elders of the church. They'll bring the oil, they'll anoint you, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and we just use it for anointing oil. So, Jerry, this, um, uh, this is your Bible. Yes, you're right. What, tell me, what, how did this come about? Tell me the first moment you saw the Bible leaking oil, where were you? What happened? Well, I, I was at home when it first started on the 27th day of January of last year, of 17. Okay. And uh, it started in Psalms 39 the, is where it started. 
The, the, the leaking of the oil came out of the scripture, Psalms 139? No, 39. Th- Psalms 39. Yes, and there was places. Hold on. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You saw the Bible, right? With oil stains. Ooze, oil oozing out of this Bible, right? You saw that, right? Well, I did what I do when somebody says, here's a Bible. I go, which Bible? Which Bible? You want to take a, just a, you just want to take a flying guess what kind of Bible it's not? It's not. Mm-mm. It it isn't. I got a screen capture of it. I looked at I looked at it and I went see, because my sheep know my voice, right? I know how God speaks in these latter days. God speaks with a lisp in these latter days because He says words like "hath" and "thou" and "doeth" and "thus." See, He speaks with a. Th- and in that quote unquote Bible that this that had an oil well in it, there was no lisp in that Bible. There was no hath and doth and saith and thou and thee in there. Anywhereeth. No. It wasn't a King James. I, I'm gonna guess probably an NIV or a New American Standard or some kind of nonsense like that. But it was not, listen, I don't have to, once I know that that's not a King James, that is not God. It's not God. It is, God has, listen, God is as far away from that Bible as heaven is from hell. That's how far away God is from that Bible. That Bible speaks lies and hypocrisy. That Bible has doctrines of devils. That Bible has the spirit of Antichrist in it. Because the spirit of Antichrist says, if any man say, if you know, if any anyone or any man or whatever saith that Jesus Christ is not come in the flesh, that's the spirit of Antichrist. And those Bibles took that out. Took it out. So that that's the spirit of Antichrist. And it has it has an oil well in it. Where does it come from? So just just so that you know that I know, so you'll know that, so I'll know that you know that that's not a King James. That's the first thing I looked at. Yeah, let's go on. On every page up to chapter 63. Three months ago, I was praying, and the Lord spoke up and says, 39. And I, and I said, what, Lord? And he says, 39. And he says, 39 represents the 39 stripes I took for healing. Stop! Stop! Psalm 39. Surely, every man walketh in a vain shoe show surely they are disquieted in vain he heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them Mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. I was dumb I opened not my mouth because thou didst it remove thy stroke away from me I, I am consumed by the blow of thine hand when thou with thy with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. Mm-mm-mm-mm. That's Psalm 39. Um, I got a little brain brain uh, vacuum here. Am I right in saying? that where is it where it actually says that Jesus received 
39 stripes. Somebody that knows my cell phone number, look that up. Send me a text message on this one. Not like five days from now. Today, am I right that it does not say that Jesus only received 39 stripes? Look it up. The Bible started leaking oil. What was the first sign of the Bible leaking oil? I mean, you looked at it. Was there a drop or what? Uh, no. The first sign was I had had my great-grandbaby came to the house on Friday. I thought she had spilled something in it because the pages had spots. It was wet. Okay. And she did. I mean, she had nothing to drink that day. Okay. So... We just got, the wife and I just got to investigating it. We, uh, you know, we reached over, we touched it, we smelled it, we tasted it. Right. To verify it. it was oil. It was oil. Yeah. Okay. How many inches of oil is in there? He's probably, he's probably right now an inch. About an inch? Yeah. About an inch. Wow. That's, and it's been up to how high? How high has it been? Ran over twice. I'll, I'll show you. Over 17 years I've owned it. I've done mark, I highlighted different scriptures. Been in the oil, it's been in the oil like 17 months, now 18, right at 18. Wow. And the highlights are still just as perfect as they were. Wow. And that has not even been faded. Look at that. No, it's, it's everything is still intact. Wow. The binder is still just as tight as it was. Because oil should damage something over a period of time, shouldn't it? Normally. Unless it's from God and anointed. You got that right. You got that right. Wow. Why? Okay, do you okay. Believe? So, here's the proof scientific, 100%, absolute. You cannot deny this logical proof that this oil is supernatural oil. The, the proof is the ink hasn't run on the pages. I mean, that's, that's it right there. That's the proof. The ink is still intact on the pages because everybody knows it's been proven scientifically. Scientific government-funded studies have proven that oil makes ink bleed on pages, right? Scientific journals have been written about this. Wikipedia articles, there's a thousand of them if there's one that oil makes ink bleed on the paper. So that, I mean, it's right there. There's your proof right there. That is of God 100%. Now, here's what they're telling you. They're telling you that the oil is a preservative. The oil acts is, is actually preserving the ink on the page. Here's my problem with that. The very Bible that he's using makes absolutely zero claim that God even preserves the words that are in that Bible. The words, that, he said that Bible 17 years old. I guarantee you, that Bible has undergone a revision in that 17-year time. If it's an NIV, I know for a fact it has. God didn't even preserve the words in his Bible. So what big deal is it if God's oil preserved the ink on the page? Who gives a flip that the, the proof is that the ink in the page hasn't run? And I'm going to ask you this. What, what verse? You see, they, they quoted no scripture in saying that God would release oil from the scriptures. That God would really super oil would come squirting out 
of a Bible. How many witnesses is there supposed to be before we believe this kind of nonsense? See, I'm holding up fingers. What other Bible is vomiting oil out of it? None that I'm aware of. Unless some copycat watches this on YouTube and wants people to get traffic to his website or store. And then, you know, it won't be oil. It'll be something like Miracle Healing Gravy or Miracle Healing Grape Jelly. Okay, or something like that. And a, a different gimmick. Because that one's already been done. That's That gimmick, they're doing that down Dalton, Georgia. Down there in that Dalton, Georgia down there. I, there's a God. But uh, God up here where we are, God is spewing grape jam out of our Bibles. Bless God. God, uh, uh, God has allowed oil to come from the Bible. Nope. Let me start by saying this. Where's the About scripture? a year ago, a friend of ours had it analyzed. Okay. Here, listen he's to a, this. Uh, listen. A, a chemist. He's a chemical engineer, been a chemist for 30 years, and he told us, he said, I didn't... Okay, hold on. About a year ago, let me start by saying this. Now, the guy that's talking, I'm not positive... I am reasonably sure the guy that's talking is the guy that owns the the business where the Bible is. So does he have an ulterior motive for trying to make everybody think that this Bible poops oil out of it? Sure he does. He's getting traffic. He never got this kind of traffic before. I guarantee you, people will come from all over the country, all over the world. See, this is the kind of junk you would find in a Mexican Catholic church in Juarez, Mexico. A Biblia spewing oil. A miracle. No, the, the oil is coming from a crucifix, or the oil is coming from a painting of Mary, or the oil is coming from a tortilla that has a burnt image of Jesus. I didn't make that part up, by the way. The oil is coming out of a tortilla that has Jesus' face burn on it, and it's a miracle, and everybody, I'm going to charge everybody uh, 6,000 pesos to come and pray before this uh, oil-spewing tortilla. That's, a, that's what you would expect that to be. But it's not. Down the Bible Belt, down in Dalton, Georgia. All. Now, we had a chemist. We had, okay, who? Who? If you had a chemist, release the name, show us his credentials, Show us the processes by which he, because he tested the oil. That's the claim. Show us the processes by which he tested the oil and then give us the printed, signed results from three different labs. Then, then, I'll still think you're lying, but it's a pretty good lie. Listen to what he says. Is to try to disprove it. I did this because of the curiosity of the chemist in me. Oh. So he had it analyzed, sent us the analysis, and the analysis was, and, we, and people have had it analyzed two other times since, and not us, just people that do it. But each time the report has come back that it had some of the characteristics of mineral oil because of the way it feels. Okay. But they said the chemical makeup of the oil, we don't know what it is. They said the only thing we do know is it's not manufactured by any man. And the best explanation we can come up with is that it's unexplainable. <gasps> Oh, boy! Three. Three different labs? Really? What labs? Where's the report? Show us the conditions that the test was done in. Show us what you do know about the oil. And how is it that you can know that it wasn't manufactured. How is it that you know that? 
Now, you want to know what I really think? You want to know what I think? I really think that some guy is slipping into that store at night and dumping a bunch of mineral oil down in that bucket, leaving without anybody seeing him, so that when they come in the next day, there's oil. See, there's a, there's a story, I, I think it's in the Apocrypha. Bell and, Bell and the Dragon, where um, the, there was a, a pagan temple and the priest of this temple, I'm trying to remember the story, they were demanding that everybody bring in all this food and all this money and all this wine and everything so because they were going to give it to the god. And they left it in front of the altar of the god. And it, they would do it at the end of the day. And in the next morning, when everybody showed up to the temple, all of a sudden, all of that food was gone. It disappeared. And they would have guards standing out in front of all the door, the entrances to the temple, so that they knew nobody was going in those doors and stealing all that stuff. They just knew it. It's a miracle. So I can't remember if it was Daniel or somebody. They got the wise idea of taking flour and sprinkling it on the floor around that idol. And the next morning they showed up and sure enough all the food was gone, but they saw these footprints that disappeared into the floor. And they found out that there was a trap door and the priests were going in and stealing all this food, money, and wine, and everything else, and taking it home and making, making everybody think that the, the God did it. You see, it, I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if these guys are lying out their pie hole. It's still a deceiving spirit. And I do. I, I, have, I have zero confidence that oil is actually supernaturally oozing out of this Bible. I have zero confidence in that. Every fiber in my being tells me that somebody's going in and dumping oil in this behind everybody's back. And they've been doing it for a long time. And the traffic just keeps pouring in. And people, people are being healed all over the place. we got people healed. Hospitals are shutting down. Doctors are moving out of our area because we don't need them no more. Bless God. We just don't need doctors. All the pharmacies, Walmart, Walmart had shut its pharmacy down because nobody was going to the pharmacy because everybody's getting this oil and they're getting it laid on them and they're getting healed of every disease that they got. And that's just the, I mean, that's just the proof right there. It's supernatural. Now, I made that up. My question is, why isn't Walmart Pharmacy going out of business in this town? Why aren't the doctors moving out of Dalton, Georgia? Why hasn't the hospital had to shut down? Why is it that the liquor stores in Dalton, Georgia are still selling liquor? Why is it that cocaine and meth and heroin are still being dealt in Dalton, Georgia? Why is it that there's still murders and, th and robberies in Dalton, Georgia? If this is God, where is the revival? I'm going to show you a little question, bit more. Why do I believe the Lord gave us the oil? Well, we've been asked that question for 18 months and never okay. had an answer. Okay. About three weeks ago, we were getting ready to go to a service on a Sunday night, and the Lord spoke, and he said, Do you want to know why I sent you the oil? No, he and didn't. Of course, he said yes. He didn't and say he that. And he said three things. He no, said, he didn't. This oil, this Bible flowing oil, he said, Man can only represent, but I manifest. Nope, said, nope, this, nope. God, God did not say that. God, and you know how I know? It's not in here. 
It's not in here. You need to understand how evil this guy that's talking to you on this video, how evil this guy is. You need to understand that this guy has got a curse on him, 22 chapters big on him. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. He's lying through his teeth. God did not say that. Bible, flowing oil is a manifestation of everything that you think is impossible. And he said, it's a manifestation of everything that you don't believe. Wow. So what he says is, I'm showing you that nothing's impossible. Nothing is unbelievable. And what I'm doing has come from that supernatural realm. And, and if you can believe that I'm doing this, he said, then everything that you've given up on, everything that you thought I wouldn't do and couldn't do, he said, it's sitting before your eyes. So when you think that something's impossible, well, what you think's impossible is sitting on a table in a tub, and it's been flowing oil for 18 months. Amazing. That's amazing. Because, look, it's one thing to put oil on and believe that the oil is anointed and it's going to heal you, right? Right. However, if we believe that, why would we not believe that oil could come from a Bible? Right. Or oil could come from anything if God ordains it, right? God ordains it. Just what you said. God says, look, I'm looking for believers in these end times. And, folks, we are in the end times. This is a sign of the times that we're in. I believe God's calling out to people. People, listen to me in this day and time. Not, you're not going to only see this miracle. You're going to see major, you see major, miracles. major, major miracles. Jerry says something every time. You ready for this? And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and poor, rich and bond, free and great, to receive a, right hand, a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell What is the root of all evil? The love of money. That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Doesn't matter if it's tears coming from a statue of Mary, an apparition to three children, a tortilla, this really happened. A tortilla, this is on, that's incredible. A tortilla. A lady thought she had burnt the tortilla, and she picked a tortilla up off the, uh, the skillet and noticed that it had the face of Jesus on it. A tortilla. So she put the tortilla in a glass case surrounded it by candles and idols and people came from miles around to pay homage and pay money to the idol of Jesus in a tortilla or a Bible that vomit let's see or a fake Bible that vomits oil it doesn't matter 
what kind of miracle it is. It's a lying sign and wonder. And God said, back in Deuteronomy 13, I'm using these to prove you whether you'll follow my word or not. See, this, this stuff is easy with me. It really is. Once the guy said in his Georgia drawl that God told him three things and none of those three things was from the scriptures, I automatically know that God didn't say it. Therefore, he lied. Whether he's pouring mineral oil at night into this tub or there really is some sort of devil, spirit, evil angel, God with a little g, that is supernaturally producing oil, spurting it out of this corrupted version of the Bible. Either way, it's irrelevant to the truth of the written record of the Word of God. See, God gave us the Scriptures. His Word in writing and then separated that from every man who says, God told me three things. So you can, you can, if you want to, you can believe that this is supernatural all. And you go down to Dalton, Georgia and get you a teacup full of it and have you a revival. You can do that if you want to. But if you'll believe these people, where does your belief stop when it comes to men and what they say? Oh, these are, these are not lying. They're men from God. Excuse me. There are quote-unquote men from God who lie every single day about every single thing about God. And they get away with it. They get away with it and they get rich. And they lead millions of people to hell. And they get away with it. And God made it simple. Trust the written word of God. Not the anecdotal word of God. The word of God that some guy came up with. Don't believe the lying signs and wonders, people. I'm going to Kenya. In Kenya, they, they fall for all kinds of things. But America is no different. No different when it comes to believing what the deceivers have to say. Come be with us in church tomorrow night. Uh, we're talking about the mediator. The media, and by the way, the mediator of Christ, he's not just the one who takes our words and gives them to God. He's the one that takes God's word and gives them to us. He's already done it. And then we're leaving Thursday. I love you. Thank you so much. God bless you. You pray for our protection. Pray for our work. Pray for the good people of Kenya. I love them or I wouldn't go out there. I love them. I love them so much. So you pray for us while we're out there. And think Bible. <laughs>